Good evening, everybody. My name is Sam Fankhauser. I'm director of the Grantham Research Institute uh, here at the LSE. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to tonight's lecture on uh, the Green New Deal. Um, and Petifer, who is going to introduce her new book to us tonight, describes herself uh, on her website as a political economist, an author, and a public speaker. And she's certainly been speaking publicly and authoring about uh, a fair few topics, uh, a lot of them to do sort of with global finance, uh, economic systems, as well as the environment. Her uh, sort of background or the, her starting point was actually uh, debt, as I understand it. She was involved, uh, amongst many other things, she was involved in the Jubilee 2000 campaign. And I look around and there's a few of you who probably don't remember the year 2000 very well. Uh, but uh, at that time, there was sort of a, a recognition of uh, an unsustainable level of debt uh, in low-income countries. And, and uh, Anne was involved in a campaign for debt relief uh, for those, uh, for those uh, third world highly indebted countries. So that was a starting point. Uh, she moved on from there uh, to figure out that the developing countries weren't the only part of the globe with uh, structural macroeconomic issues. So she wrote in 2006, she wrote another book, The Coming First World Debt Crisis. So moving from developing to developed countries. It was quite well timed because what she said in that book is roughly what happened two years later in the global financial crisis of 2008. So Anne has to the claim to fame that she correctly predicted the financial crisis of 2008. Amongst sort of her more formal uh, roles and accomplish accomplishments, uh, she is a well-known sort of Keynesian macroeconomist. She, she uh, currently works uh, as director of Prime Economics, which is a, which is a network of Keynesian economists. Um, she's a council member of the Progressive Economic Forum, and you start sort of developing a sense of, of where her sort of political and economic uh, uh, sort of instincts are. And indeed, another thing she is, uh, she is an eco on the Economic Advisory Committee of Jeremy Corbyn. Whether that makes her an economic advisor to the next government or not is your guess is as good as mine. Uh, but she's certainly well clued up with, uh, with, with that sort of narrative uh, of, of, uh, of left of the center economic thinking. But tonight, of course, she's going to talk about the environment. Uh, and she's going to talk about uh, the case for the Green New Deal, um, which is a book that, she, that she's just published. But it's actually thinking that goes back 10 years or so. And she was sort of telling me when, when we met before how she would sort of uh, assemble a group of like-minded thinkers, environmentalists, economists. Uh, she would cook them pasta, they would bring drinks, and they would talk about uh, the things that are wrong with the financial system and the environmental system. That's sort of going back, yeah, 10 years or so, 2008. Uh, where she started talking uh, and then publishing a book about the Green New Deal, uh, so roughly 10 years before the US Democrats around uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, discovered the term. So there's an intellectual heritage uh, which goes back to Anne, and so she will tell us about uh, her journey, how she discovered the sort of environmental urgency that we write a lot about in the Grantham Research Institute, that idea that you need a systemic transformation of our economic system if you want to deal with the climate change and related ecological crisis. She brings to that, of course, also her sort of new Keynesian macroeconomic views. So we're in for a very exciting evening. Let me therefore stop here um, and let me welcome Anne, Anne Pettifor.
thank you very much. Um, I haven't checked uh, my slides, but I... Yeah, they are. They're there. Wonderful. Uh, first of all, can I say what an honour it is to be here as uh, a guest of the Grantham Institute. Uh, Nick Robbins is a good friend, and I know a lot about what wonderful work you do. So for me, it's a, a real honour to be in this distinguished group and to have you all listen. Um, I need to say that I'm actually not going to say too much about the environment. I'm assuming that we all understand the scale of the crisis and the immediacy of the crisis. I am mainly going to talk about the, the economic approach to it, but it's only because I assume that you all share my view that the, the crisis, the, the ecological crisis is extremely urgent and we need a transformation, in my view, to begin tomorrow. Um, and unfortunately, our politicians don't seem to have understood that yet. So I want to begin by uh, explaining what the Green New Deal is, because there's a, quite a lot of confusion about it. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Am I clear to you? Yeah? So I want to start by saying that it's cathedral thinking to save the planet. Um, as Greta said, we must lay the foundation while we may not know exactly how to build the ceiling. So we are thinking big and structural um, because we know that for us to save the planet, uh, to save the ecosystem, we need to transform the economy. Can I, Sam, could I just have some water, please? Absolutely. So we're demanding system change, not just climate change. And on the advice of George Monbiot, we talk about climate breakdown too. And so we want system change, understanding that finance, the economy, thank you so much, and the ecosystem are tightly bound together. And, and that, that, that at the same time, the system is internationalized um, with the fin finance sector in control, exercising private authority over the global economy. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but this is the context in which we're discussing uh, the ecosystem. And I'm keen for us to do this because for too long, environmentalists have talked about tackling the crisis by altering individual behavior on the one hand and community behavior on the other. But actually what we need to be thinking is structural change, system change. Now the key th point I'd like to get through to you is that we don't govern our economy. Our governments, uh, nation states, uh, po political systems don't effectively govern the economy. And Alan Greenspan is the authority on that. Thanks to globalization, he said, policy decisions in the United States have largely been replaced by global market forces. National security aside, it hardly makes any difference who will be the next president, or for that matter, the next prime minister of Britain? Because, he said, the world is governed by market forces. And we tend to forget that when we nag at our politicians, when we give our politicians a hard time, when we blame them for not fixing things, we forget that actually they're not in charge. Global markets are in charge. So the DND, &D, the Green New Deal, requires public authority over what we call the giant global spigot of mainly unregulated credit creation. Um, it's very hard to picture what the international financial sector does, but what it does largely is to spew out trillions of dollars, and I'll give you some numbers in a minute, of credit. Um, and that credit is not carefully aimed uh, it's not thought through what is going to happen with that credit, where it's invested, or um, how it's going to be repaid. On the whole, the credit is simply spewed out in the hope that it will make capital gains for the creditor. But it's that credit that fuels consumption on the one hand, production on the other, and then, of course, greenhouse gas emissions. So for me, it's really important that we understand that connection between, if you like, the host pipe of credit, the con consumption, production, and greenhouse gas emissions, and then, of course, the ultimate thing, which is rent-seeking, i.e., 
This is creditors who hope to make capital gains not from investing and creating new assets, but from uh, using existing ass assets from which to extract rent effortlessly. Uh, and Rana Faruha, who's a columnist on the Financial Times, has written a brilliant book about this. So, as Bill McKibben has argued, money is the ox oxygen on which the fire of global warming burns. I suspect he wrote in the New Yorker a couple of weeks ago that the key to disrupting the flow of carbon into the atmosphere may lie in disrupting the flow of money into coal and oil and gas. Consider J.P. Morgan Chase, America's largest bank and the world's most valuable by market capitalization. In the three years since the end of the Paris Club talks, Chase has reportedly committed $196 billion in financing for the fossil fuel industry. Much of it to fund extreme new ventures, ultra deep sea drilling, Arctic oil extraction, and so on. Compare that to Exxon, which by contrast spent less than $3 billion on oil extraction research and development each year in the three years after the Paris Club Agreement. So really, the fuel for the fire of carbon, uh, that's burning carbon, is is provided by the finance sector and not even by the companies themselves. So in 2018, of the $1.8 trillion invested in all aspects of the energy sector, around $300 billion only went into re renewables. The bulk of the rest was devoted to fossil fuels led by oil and gas, as you know. And few investments in the renewable, re renewable projects can make returns of more than 5 to 8%, whereas typical investments in oil and gas projects where the barriers to entry are much higher, earn returns of 15% or more. Hence, J.P. Morgan's chase, Chase's di uh, direct, directing of their spigot of credit, if you like, at the oil, gas, and um, coal industries. So we believe the Green New Deal, in, in, in the, 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 the original architects of the Green New Deal, that these conditions demand structural and system change, not just behavioral community or technological change, to permit public investment aimed at renewables and sustainability. It is clear to us that the level of transformation that is needed in order to tackle the climate breakdown and extinctions requires state investment and state interventions. That's the scale because of the scale of intervention that is needed, right? And, um, and I particularly believe that the state has to front end investment in order to enable the private sector to participate in the transformation, but also to enable citizens to play their part. And I always uh, mention Ken Livingston and his project uh, when he decided to introduce the congestion charge here in London. Some of you won't know, have remembered Le uh, um, Ken Livingston, but he was the mayor of London, and he proposed introducing the congestion charge. And his staff warned him that if he did that, he was going to lose his next election. It was going to be very, very unpopular. And on the day that Ken introduced the congestion charge, he put 300 new buses on the streets of London. And so commuters had an alternative. They had somewhere else, some other way in which to get around London. And so there was not as much of a furore around the tax as was expected. So for me, we need to front-end front investment in our transport, energy, and land use systems to enable citizens to participate and to behave and conduct themselves differently. So it requires massive state investment, and only the state can do that. One of my colleagues uh, uh, on the Labour Party advisory was Mariana Matsukato, and she's written a wonderful book called The Entrepreneurial State, in which she argues that the private sector is like a timid mouse and the, the public sector a roaring lion. And that's why you know, all of the modern technology we use today, our iPhones, almost everything that's in our iPhone was invented, the internet and all of that invented in the first instance within the, the state because the state could afford to take those risks and as like a roaring lion was not afraid to take those risks. Steve Jobs would have been a little more cautious. So, the key point I want to bring to you tonight 
is that the New Deal, on which the Green New Deal is based, originated with Keynes in 1919. And I hope you won't mind if we divert a bit and go back and talk about the history of this, because for me it's incredibly important in understanding why the, New Deal, the Green New Deal is what it was. So this is 1919, exactly 100 years ago. World leaders were gathered in Paris. Europe was in chaos. Europe was collapsing. Uh, this had been an incredibly destructive war. Um, and there was Bolshevism in Russia. There were uprisings in Germany. There was an anarchy and chaos across Europe. And Keynes was very angry because it was clear to him the leaders cared not a damn for the future of the people of Europe. They cared not a damn, they cared only about their own political interests, and they were willing to sacrifice Germany and make Germany pay for a war which had been rather pointless, but which they themselves had um, helped to trigger. So as Karl Polanyi has written, the war was about nothing in particular, and it had settled nothing essential. Yet it had been more terrible than all its predecessors. And he argues that this underlying comprehensive event was no other than the dissolution of the international system upon which, he said, our civilization had unconsciously depended for its life and growth. What he goes on to show is that institutions had collapsed. The whole system, the whole international, the whole of Western civilization had collapsed. And he said, what is so interesting and it is still the case, that as a rule, a society does not become conscious of the true nature of the institutions under which it lives until those institutions have already passed. We're not aware, on the whole, that our economy is governed by market forces. We're aware of globalization, we know about how international it all is, and so we know big, bad corporations, etc. We don't really, society as a whole is not aware that we're governed by those institutions. We're not aware, for example, of our monetary institutions and how they operate. When many of us are not aware that we live in a, a, an economy with developed monetary institutions, which enables us to have money and which enables us to argue that we can afford what we can do that we can afford to transform the economy and save the planet because of the nature of the monetary system that we enjoy. And I speak about this uh, quite passionately because I've worked in Africa where they don't have monetary systems. So the monetary institutions that are so important to us include, for example, the central bank that has to be relatively independent but plays a pivotal role in determining the value of the currency. There's our system of taxation which backs up if you like, the central bank and the value of the currency. Uh, the British currency is backed by 30 million taxpayers. That's what makes it strong. The United States' currency, the dollar, is backed by 140 million taxpayers. If you go to Malawi, they don't have a tax collection system of any uh, soundness. And when they do have taxes, there's very few. So their currency has very little value. We have a criminal justice system for enforcing contracts. Uh, contracts. We all know, I hope, that money is nothing more than a promise to pay. But that promise has to be upheld. It has to be upheld by a criminal justice system and by a system that upholds contracts. So when you go out and use your credit card, you, you haven't put money in the bank. You haven't, in advance of buying that washing machine from a big store, you haven't moved your savings out of your bank account and into your credit card. No, you walk into a shop and you show the shopkeeper a card. And the card says, you can trust Anne Pettifor to pay £300 for a washing machine. And I, the bank, endorse this. You, you show the card, the shopkeeper makes a note, and you put it back in your pocket. There's been no transaction, there's no exchange of money. You've just made this promise to pay. Now, for that to work, we need institutions that underpin that promise, uh, and the criminal justice system is that. We also need a sound accounting system for managing assets and counting and managing assets and liabilities. These are the public institutions that if we didn't have, we would have no money. Malawi lacks these institutions, and as a result, 
in Malawi, there is no money. Malawi relies on other people's money, on the United States dollar, on the euro, on the yen, and so on. And that costs her a great deal. So public institutions are really important. Degrade them, undermine them, and you can undermine the system. And this is what happened in 1919. The whole system of the economy at the time collapsed. The whole system of civilization collapsed. And Polanyi argues, and I think he's correct to do so, that it's really unsustainable for a society to com com contain within its orbit a separate self-regulating and autonomous economic sphere. That, he said, is a utopia. Right. So if you separate the political, the democratic, the regulatory from the market, which is what globalization is and is which was what the gold standard was, you create these two separate spheres. And he argued that these two separate pillars of liberal capitalism and representative democracy were the thing, were the clue, the separation of them, with what is the clue to its rapid downfall, to the fact that it collapsed so easily in 1919. I say all this because I want us to understand how catastrophic circumstances were in 1919 when Keynes turned up at the conference and, and became very embittered by the way in which the leaders were dealing with the threats posed to European citizens. He proposed a scheme for the rehabilitation of European credit and for financing relief and reconstruction. It was a plan, it was a grand scheme, but it was transformative. It was, in fact, revolutionary. And I need not remind you that it's forgotten about. It's not talked about. Keynes has talked about as tax and spender, a fiscal concern, mainly with fiscal policy. But he was concerned overwhelmingly with reintegrating the economic with the political, reintegrating the, the markets with democratic institutions. So his plan with key specifications for the redesigning of the international financial architecture, which at the time was the gold standard, and that was like today governed by private authority over the international financial system. He wanted to assert public authority over the system. So his idea would be was that Germany would issue a bond a promise to pay for a billion pounds. But everybody knew, that, of course, that Germany couldn't pay. She'd been, her economy had been destroyed. She was in collapse, a state of collapse. But the point about the bonds was that they would have priority over all other German obligations. So if Germany, Germany's military had borrowed from the private sector, these bonds would have priority over any private sector bonds. The key point about it is that enemy nations, Britain, France, and the United States, would guarantee them jointly and severally, and, and at the rate of 20% each, right? And the rest of the Allies would guarantee the rest. And this guarantee would give that bond its authority, would make it transform it into a safe asset, right? That would enable Germany to raise finance for, re for recovery and recuperation. But he also had a bigger plan, which was that the bond would become a new system of money. They would be acceptable as payment between allied governments and as first-class collateral at central banks. So the French could use them to pay debts to the British, and the British could use them to pay debts to the Americans. So in other words, what he was trying to do was to construct a new financial system with a new system for a new kind of international money, for, go for governments, for states to settle their accounts with each other. And of course, this is the basis of his plan for an international clearing union as well. Keynes's plan included provisions for the other central powers and new nations to issue similar bonds. So then enter Mr. Thomas Lamont, chief of executive of, wait for it, J.P. Morgan. And Mr. Lamont writes the letter back on behalf of President Wilson and says, no, that the United States can't back this idea. And the United States believes that the refinancing of Germany must take place through the usual private channels. And in doing so, it is the usual private channels writing the letter. But Keynes was not aware of that time. This has all been uh, recently uh, revealed by a wonderfully uh, uh, historian, economic historian, Eric Rauchway. 
So he writes and says no, and he destroys the plan. And the result is that Germany then relies for finance on the international markets, on Wall Street, essentially. And we know what, was the, what were the consequences of that refusal to deal with the system and with, with that refusal to transform an economic system that had become so bifurcated and was dominated by financial markets. Now, the key thing about this story, and you must be wondering why I'm telling you this story, is that we go from 1919 to 1933, and Europe goes through various cataclysms. Indeed, the world does. Very interestingly, the United States is plunged into a recession in 1920-21, immediately after the war. There, is, there are upheaval strikes, general strikes, riots, the Bolsheviks, everything going on in Europe. In Britain, there's a general strike in 26, and of course, in 1929, in the run-up to 1929, there's a deregulation of credit. The credit spigot is released, and there's a massive inflation of credit aimed at the stock market, and then in 29, there's a massive deflation of credit, and the Great Depression starts. And the key thing about Keynes' scheme is that it's revived by Roosevelt. On the night of his inauguration, 6th of March, 1933, he makes a passionate speech. In his inaugural speech, it's a wonderful speech. I do recommend you go back to it. And he talks about chasing the moneylenders from the temple of our civilization. He's very clear because he'd been governor of New York uh, during, uh, during the period of the 1929 crisis, and he'd watched as 5,000 banks a week went bust and as you know, unemployment rose to 25% of the American working population. So the night of his inauguration, he goes back to the White House and he says, we're going to dismantle the gold standard. I want the banks to hand over their gold tonight and tomorrow. And his advisors say, well, that can't happen because it's the Sabbath. You're going to have to wait till Monday. So he closes the banks on the Monday and he demands the, the, the banks hand over their gold and he demands that private citizens do the same. This is a report in the New York Times, and interestingly, it only appears in April, a month after he'd done all this. And that's because he manipulated the media rather well, did Roosevelt. He was quite a crafty character. The key thing about the New Deal is that it begins with the transformation of the financial system, and begins with the transformation of the international economic order, as it then was. And he dismant by dismantling it, he places a democratic government, not Wall Street, in the driving seat of the economy. This enables the government to spend without having Wall Street shouting at, as we had today. I've been on the radio today because already the panic is rising amongst economists and an Institute for Fiscal Studies and Resolution Fund. The world is going to fall down, it's going to collapse because the public debt is rising, because, the gov because governments are planning to spend. Both the Tories and the Labour Party are planning to spend. Panic has already been triggered here as we stand today. Pretty much the same would have happened in 1933. But by dismantling the gold standard, in a sense, what, what Roosevelt does is he takes the bite out of that and he enables government, not Wall Street, to be in the driving seat of the economy. This is enables him to tackle the, uh, the, the, the scourge of unemployment, which was very high, 25%. It enables him to invest in creating work for American workers and also in events, of course, in American uh, social security and so on. But most importantly, it enables him to invest in transforming the Dust Bowl, the ecological crisis of 1933, by, amongst other things, planting three billion trees, we now know, right? So this was a very severe crisis, which spread from Texas through to Nebraska. Ag agricultural policies had denuded the land, and people were migrating in their thousands away. It was causing massive disruption. And one of the first things he does is to set up the Conservation Corps and employ hundreds of thousands of men, and they were mainly men, and they were mainly white, so the man he has his enormous imperfections and he gets lots of policies wrong, but he employs people immediately in these conservation calls and, go, and they go around dealing with this very severe crisis. 
And in, in addition to that, he invested in the arts and in culture. John, Stein books, John Steinbeck's book on the Grapes of Wrath was funded by a, a, a grant from the, from the Roosevelt administration. So do you see where I'm taking you? That this New Deal, the Green New Deal, is embedded, it, it originates with these ideas, 1919, 1933, and now back to 2019. So for us, the key thing about the Green New Deal is that we must manage the spigot that drives the hyper-globalization juggernaut. We want to restore public authority and management of credit creation. Credit creation, as I explained earlier, depends on these publicly financed uh, institutions backed by taxpayers. If we take away, for example, the safe assets, which are government debt, uh, Companies like BlackRock and Blackstone and private equity firms that are desperate to hold on to uh, safe assets, for which there are a shortage of safe assets. London property is not a safe asset. Picasso's works of art are not a safe asset. They can degrade and deteriorate. Government debt, backed by 30 million taxpayers, is a very safe asset. And there's a shortage of this stuff uh, because, of, um, because of austerity. But, but, but basically, uh, th these assets are things that we should be able to manage because they, they are vital to the private finance sector, but they are assets that are created and backed by taxpayers. So we want to see public authority restored through central bank action to green collateral frameworks, i.e. for central banks to exclude brown assets from eligibility uh, as for, for uh, eligibility for uh, central bank resources. In other words, we all know QE, quantitative easing, is a process whereby central banks exchange assets for uh, central bank money, which are reserves. They're not like the money that you and I have, but it is still money. It is still, they are resources for the banking system and the financial sector, right? But, but they will only provide that in exchange for an asset and the signing of a contract and, of course, the agreement over a rate of interest right, for, that, for that exchange. So we're arguing that central banks must now stop accepting onto their balance sheets brown assets. There's a huge argument. We've just written a paper with Professor Daniel, Daniela Gabor on how you work out the taxonomy of brown assets and green assets. How do you determine what is a green asset and what is a brown asset? I'm going to leave that to the experts, and we don't have to think about it now, but we do have to think about the role that our central bank's playing in propping up the private financial sector and doing it almost unquestioningly and unconditionally. From now on, the conditions have to be, thou shalt not obtain uh, uh, central bank resources unless you have on offer assets that can be defined as green assets. That will be a, ma a major discipline on the financial sector. So we want to manage access in general to central bank resources uh, to public safe assets. I believe, and this is controversial still in some circles, but it's graining credibility, I believe that we should manage the flow of capital across borders because uh, uh, flows in and out of and across borders can be extremely volatile and can be uh, extremely disruptive. If we want to be able to spend, we want stability of the currency and we want stability of the economy. We don't want the finance sector to take all its money and zoom out and then come back again. But one of the most important reasons for managing capital mobility is so that we can, we can tax these great beer moths that are now big, the world's global platform uh, uh, companies. And it's no good talking about tax justice and so on in a world of capital mobility. There's no way you're going to get tax justice if Apple or Amazon or Starbucks can just take their money across the road to Ireland uh, at, uh, at a whim. And the other point that I'm passionate about is the management of interest rates across the spectrum of lending and borrowing. And Keynes is pa passionate about this too. His general theory is called the general theory of employment, interest, and money, right? And the reason for that is that interest is extractive. And I've, I, my experience as, a, as working with sovereign debt countries made this very clear to me. If you're Brazil and you have foreign debts, you have to strip your forests to raise the hard currency, the dollars needed to repay your foreign debt. You have to fish your seas 
to raise the hard currency, the, the dollars that you need to repay your foreign debt, right? But equally, in our own economy, people are having to work longer hours. We get, we're having to strip our, our ecosystem of its assets in order to generate the resources needed for managing uh, exponential rates of increase, compound interest, if you like, of, uh, set by, by creditors. And, and it's about tackling interest in, it's about how fundamental interest is to the ecosystem that I would like to, to, to raise with you. Um, I think it's extremely important. Of course, this has to be a globally coordinated reflation strategy, and we work with UNCTAD's trade and development uh, on this because there has to be a focus on structural transformation uh, led by the public sector, not just here, but across the world. So, we've, uh, we've transformed the financial system, we now have a new, more balanced system, and we have public authority of it. So, what is the Green New Deal economy going to look like? What are the principles of it? Well, I, I mean, I, in my little modest little book, I try to outline that uh, in, 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 in basic terms, but I simply want to outline what I believe ought to be the principles. And there, this is for debate, of course we can argue about this. So, for me, it has to be a steady-state economy. We have to end the delusion of infinite expansion. And by that, I mean we can't use the term growth anymore. Personally, I find the term growth uh, totally unacceptable. Uh, not many people know this, but until the 1960s, it wasn't much used in economics. It was reinvented, if you like, by the OECD and Sam Britton of the Financial Times back in the early 60s. And I think the reason for that was, was that Britain's economy wasn't growing at the same rate as the financial economy was growing. So if you think about financial speculation, it can, it makes, financial speculation leads to capital gains, right? And capital gains can be exponential. As an example, if you take out uh, a ticket on the lottery and you win a million bucks, you can make a, you know, an exponential capital gain overnight. That's the joy of speculation. You can make very big potatoes, uh, very large sums of money. And you can do that effortlessly, more or less effortlessly. Um, so what happened in the 1960s was that the OECD felt that the British economy was, was sluggish, wasn't growing fast enough. And they set a target for Britain to grow by 50% within 10 years, which was totally unsustainable, crazy. And that was at a time of full employment. So naturally, if you set the target at 50% and you're at full employment, you are encouraging the economy to exceed its capacity. And when the economy exceeds its capacity, we get inflation as night follows day. And that's what happened. And who got the blame? Keynes on the one hand, and the trade unions on the other. The finance sector was left out of it, and the OECD has been left out of the story. So I don't even believe in using the word growth or even the term degrowth, because degrowth is, uh, is a, a way of just accepting the framing. By negating the frame, you're accepting the frame. So we shouldn't even use the term. What we need to understand is the need for a steady state economy. Uh, we need an economy based on two budgets the nation's economic budget, nested within its carbon budget. And of course, that's going to have to happen at an international level. Scientists will give us the global carbon budget, but then we're going to have to have national budgets, and we're going to have to live within those budgets. Um, I've been talking and working with Kevin Anderson, and they're advising the mayor of Manchester on Manchester's budget, and I believe Norwich has a budget too, a carbon budget. And, and, and so the mayor of Manchester is beginning to think about what change has to happen to transport energy and land use systems in Manchester to live within the carbon budget that's been set. And it's a very radical budget. I, and we don't think that the mayor fully understands how radical it is. <laughs> so we want a, an economy that's based largely on self-sufficiency, localization. We feel, I feel strongly about that. I feel strongly that... Our economy has become enriched, if you like, by extraction of assets from poor countries. 
that we rely heavily on, uh, on extracting the wealth of other countries in order to maintain our own wealth. Uh, I, and I'm arguing, and we argue, that we need a more localised economy, a more self-sufficient economy, and to put it crudely, we're going to have to start growing our own green beans. We can't fly them in from Kenya, drain the water table of Kenya, and fly in green beans. Uh, because we don't fancy growing them ourselves. We're going to have to do that. We're going to have to stop uh, using up the water and other ecological services of poor countries. And the same applies to cotton, of course, and what's happening in India, as, as again, the Indian, as, as large swathes of the Indian water table are drained in order to produce the kind of cotton that we like to use for our blue jeans and so on. So self-sufficiency is a principle, in our view, of the Green New Deal. And then the Green New Deal has to be a labour-intensive economy. We have to substitute labour for carbon. We're going to have to work uh, and do the work that carbon does. We're going to have to do ourselves, in our view. That's going to make it a very labour-intensive economy. Um, and I think that, that would be a good thing. Um, and, of course, it, could be a, it must be a, a mixed-market economy because you know, human, humanity has had mixed-market economies for thousands of years, 5,000 years, I think, at least. So we, must, uh, we can maintain that. Then there's a principle of investing in limited needs, not unlimited wants, in focusing society's priorities on needs and not wants. And this is a really, this is, takes us back to consumption, endless consumption, the fashion industry, the need to constantly turn over and renew and do different things and so on. So limited needs, and we've defined those, and they're based on the work of Ian Goff, who's of this university, and they are survival, adequate nutrition, food and water, health, physical security, economic security, protective housing, safe work environment, security in childhood, significant primary relationships, basic education, freedom from impression. The work that we should do should be to, to satisfy society's needs and not necessarily society's wants. So then that brings me to the big question of how to pay for the Green New Deal. Um, I mean, we, you all know and we all know that there have been massive estimates of what it's going to cost. Um, and some of these are real, some of them are less real. And I, I, I mean, I personally have looked at all the, the estimates, uh, but who knows how much it's going to cost. We all, all we know is it's going to cost a great deal. It's as if we would be going to war, and we know that in order to prepare ourselves, we're going to have to spend. So where will the money come from? So there's only two sources of finance. There's credit and there's savings. And the question is, how do we use those two sources of finance to finance uh, a transformation of the economy away from its dependence on fossil fuels? Savings are the consequence of credit. They are not the source of credit. The bank doesn't have savings in the bank when you apply for a loan. The, uh, savings are a consequence of the bank creating credit, which you then use to invest and generate income. So savings are a consequence of credit, and they are, we have savings, but they're not the source of finance immediately. Tax revenues equally are the consequence of credit-financed public and private investment. Right. So when, when the public sector invests in jobs, as you know from your own experience, uh, at the end of the month you get a salary, you earn income, and that income is for your personal use, but you also invariably pay taxes. Uh, if not PAYE, you also pay uh, VAT and so on. So tax revenues are a consequence, really, of employment, which is why employment was so important to the general theory. So in a monetary economy, savings originate as credit, and that means that society is no longer dependent on those with savings or surpluses for finance. So we don't have to depend on rich people or on rich governments uh, or on those who've saved carefully and nurtured their savings. We don't have to depend on them for finance. Those with accumulated capital no longer are sole providers of finance in a monetary economy. And this is good news. Savings are not needed for investment, right? So we have two sources of credit. We have the central bank, which provides credit at the macro level, if you like, 
to clients, which are banks and other financial institutions, in exchange, as I said earlier, for contract, for a contract, for collateral and for interest. And then we have private banks, which provide credit at the micro level, in exchange for a contract, collateral and interest. We have shadow banks, we have a massive shadow banking system, which provides credit out there in the stratosphere, in the markets, uh, credit and capital in exchange for a contract, collateral, safe assets and haircuts. Right, so the shadow banking um, sector operates, if you like, as a, as, a, as a great pawn shop out in the sky where overnight uh, assets are exchanged for cash and big institutions holding our savings, like BlackRock and other pension funds and insurance companies, have, an, have, have scooped up all of our savings as cash, and they swap this cash for an asset, often overnight, in a system known as repos. So then where does credit come from? So how much credit is there? So at the individual level, credit is funding expenditure by paying from future income. So when you use your credit card, as I said earlier, you haven't got money in the bank. You're saying, but what happens when you do use your credit card is that a sum of money is deposited in the shopkeeper's bank. He gets £300 for a washing machine. You then take the card back and you pay yourself back over time. Uh, and the bank acts as your intermediary and charges you a fee for managing the process. <coughs> Get it? So that's, that's how we create credit. We give ourselves purchasing power if we're fortunate enough to have a credit card. And of course, we only have a credit card if we have income and assets and so on. So this is how it works at an individual level. But at the level of the state, it is financing current spending investment from the state's future income. If we are the state, and if the state is us, we are, we are doing the same thing as we do with our credit card. We're spending, and we're paying for it out of our future income but it's immediate expenditure, which can be used on projects. So how much is there? Central banks um, have issued $13 trillion, roughly, in credit uh, since the financial crisis. $13 trillion sounds like a lot of money, uh, but it isn't, in fact. Um, according to the Bank for International Settlements, there is something like $183 trillion out there in total credit to the non-financial sector. Now that's private banks, high street banks, lending money to the non-financial sector, lending credit. 183, this is the spigot. This is the spigot of credit. Now there's a big question as to whether or not all that credit will be repaid at some point, remembering that global income is only about $80 trillion. Uh, that's an awful lot of credit, and, and it's why the IMF, the World Bank, and the Bank for International Settlements are worried about the degree of debt out there. It begins as credit. But that's how much the private banking system has create, created for the non-financial sector. And then the shadow banking sector apparently has about, uh, according to the Financial Stability Board, has $185 trillion in assets, financial assets as well. These are really, this is big money we're talking about here. In total, total global financial assets amount to $377.8 trillion. Now, that's a lot of money out there that's been created for what purpose? We're not at all sure. But what it shows you is <laughs> there is no shortage of this stuff. The question is who manages it and in whose interests and where is it going? That is the real question. And that's what we don't know. We do know our pensions are involved here somewhere, but we're not at all sure what is happening to that stuff because it's, it's really uh, quite detached. So this is what the, the FSB, how, this is how they define it. Total financial assets, 382 trillion. They're insisting on calling the shadow banking sector, um, what are they, monitoring universe of non-bank financial intermediation. <laughs> they don't like shadow banking. They think it has a... And, and other financial institutions. So you see, we're, we're seeing that there's an awful lot of money created out of there. For, we're not quite sure for what purpose. And then we can look at savings. We know that there is something like $43 trillion in savings um, managed globally in pension funds, asset management funds. An awful lot of that is sitting there out there in the stratosphere 
And the big investment management funds don't quite know what to do with it. They don't have, there's not enough, they, they can't put it in the high street banks because the high street, the government's only guarantee about £80,000 worth of investment, of, of, of deposits in a bank, right? So if you've got uh, six and a half trillion, which is what BlackRock has, you're not going to put it in a high street bank. So you're out there in the stratosphere and you've got to earn more money. You've got to earn more money in order to pay pensions in the future. How do you do that? What do you invest in? So you invest in all kinds of speculative activities you can think of. God knows what they are. And then you, in, you engage in a shadow banking system. You, you turn yourself into a bank and you lend some of that money out and hope to make some money from that. So there's an awful lot of pension money out there. And then British savings alone amount to 4.4 trillion pounds. So we know there's an awful lot of savings that could help pay for this. There's no shortage of saving. So for me, there is no shortage of finance for the Green New Deal. We can afford to finance a transformation of the economy away from, this, from its dependence on fossil fuel. And we can afford to create the jobs that need to be created and, and finance the projects that need to happen. But in order to do that, we have in the first instance to transform the financial system. Our real shortage, the real shortage we have, is of projects and plans for the transformation of the economy and the ecosystem. We haven't thought about that enough. You know, there's all this money, but it has to have projects to be spent on. And those projects, we're not thinking about that because the government is saying, no, we don't have any money. We haven't got any money. We can't get any money, says the government. And so nobody's thinking about how on earth, what are we going to do? The really big uh, the challenge that we all face is, is how to develop the projects and plans for transformation of the economy. I'll end on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. This was a fascinating economic history lesson and a radical agenda. So if you don't have any questions, there's something wrong with you. Um, but let me remind you that questions are not the same as comments. Let me also remind you that we like our questions short and to the point. Let's collect uh, a few um, at the same time. Uh, let's start somewhere. In the middle up, there's a hand uh, right at the fringe in the middle. And can we have women, please? I'm a feminist. I want to see more women putting their hands up. That is a good... I was desperately trying to find them. But let's, let's start with the gentleman, then get the gender balance right. There we go. Yeah, good. Um, hello. Could you um, just briefly say um, how close any of the political parties in Britain are to this? I imagine the Green Party are quite close. You mentioned Labour. It would be really interesting to know whether they're I edging in this way um, or not. Sure. Okay. There was a... Uh, the there? There's a lady somewhere on the right there. Oh, yes. Over there. I see you. Yes, I've got two questions related to the relationship of the national to the global. Yeah. You said that um, to, to achieve a transformation of our national economy, other global players, other countries have to be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so is it unrealistic for a political party to offer a Green New Deal in one country? And the other thing is, um, if we are going to grow our own beans, and save the water table in Kenya, mm. what about the lack of, what are we going to do about the lack of jobs and employment in Kenya? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, that, uh, let's take one more. Uh, is that a hand or are you just scratching your, your chin? No, you're scratching your chin. Let's, let's come here to the front. There's a lady just in the middle there. I'm just interested to know how you make the pension funds and so on um, get on board with this, really. Okay, so that was three people, four questions. Why don't we give you a chance to answer those and then we yeah. have another round. Do you mind if I stand up? Because I, I can't talk you sitting down. So, um, <laughs> so how close are the political parties? I, 
I think the political party, I think certainly the Labour Party is working up to this and certainly the Green Party is working up to this. The Lib Dems, I mean, the Lib Dems were at one stage one of the most radical parties when it came to uh, green transformation, but I'm not aware of where they are now. Um, but none of them, and except with the exception perhaps of the Green Party, are thinking in transformational terms, really, and are thinking about the international system. And the reason why I've harped on about it tonight is that you know, the question, is get, the question that we're all facing now is not, will there be another financial crisis? The question is, when will it be, right? And the timing of it. The one thing I didn't ever get right in 2006 was the timing. I was convinced it would have all crashed by the end of 2006, and I was terribly wrong, right? So timing and whatever will trigger it, we don't know what that will be, but it's going to happen. And my concern is the political po parties are behaving all... Brexit is making us so inward-looking, we're behaving as if we don't need to prepare for that. And many progressive people were not prepared for the last crisis, didn't know what had happened, were stunned, didn't know this could happen, and had no alternative, right? And so, in fact, the system's reinforced itself since then. So, I, I mean, I don't think the parties are prepared for thinking about the global system and for thinking about transforming it. Um, as, but, but, but the question will be what will happen if there is a crisis. The question about global and, and national is a really important one. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, Roosevelt was president of the United States and he unilaterally embarked on... This. By the way, Britain had already dropped out of the gold standard in 1931, but that was almost by accident and we were forced to because we just simply couldn't sustain it any longer. But even when that happened, nobody believed... And it was happened uh, under Ramsay MacDonald, nobody believed it could happen. Uh, with Roosevelt, it was very much a deliberate strategy and, of course, his economy, uh, the United States economy, was big and powerful enough to do that unilaterally. But, but I think the key thing about Roosevelt was that he exercised political leadership and then subsequently brought other countries in. And what's very striking about the Bretton Woods Conference, for example, was that it was uh, attended by economists from all over the world. He was very internationalist in that sense. So, yes, it would take more than one country and it would take international coordination. If there's going to be another global financial crisis, I can assure you there will be international coordination. There was during the last one, but it was international coordination to save the finance sector, not to save the world, basically. So um, we know the central bankers will definitely coordinate and I think politicians will. So, but we need a political, we need the political leadership to make that happen. And we don't have that, mainly because in my view, we don't have the movement from below that should generate that leadership. Um, and what will, the, will uh, uh, taking green beans away from Kenya do for local jobs? I can tell you that Kenya has an awful lot of work to do. She has an awful lot of unemployed people and low paid people. And all of the work they have to do to tackle their climate crisis re requires them to use all their resources for their own purposes and not to use their resources. For now, all uh, low-income countries, all countries, are persuaded to orient their economy to exports because exports earn hard currency dollars and enables you to pay foreign debts, essentially. And what Kenya is going to have to do is actually focus on her people and on full employment in Kenya. And of course, we'll expect countries to trade, and of course, we'll expect them to act uh, collaboratively uh, across boundaries. But primarily, uh, they have to care about their own, their own people. Um, how to make pension funds do what we want them to do? Well, it really isn't hard. Um, I, I've forgotten who asked that question. Sorry, hi, yes. That it really isn't hard. I mean, the fact of the matter is that you, it's easy to incentivize them. They're already incentivized with all sorts of tax breaks. Uh, and those tax breaks incentivize them, to, in my view, to do the wrong things. We can incentivize them to do the right things. We can give them tax breaks if they, for example, channel their funds into the Green New Deal. Um, but actually, they really require, you know, a stable and steady environment in which to operate, and I think would value that. And they also require a prosperous economy. We've had 10 years of austerity and lack of prosperity. We, the global economy, I'm afraid, has not yet recovered from the crisis. Um, and that's not good for business either. So in my view, um, 
I think, but it's going to be very painful. It's going to be very difficult when you're managing six and a half trillion dollars of pension funds uh, and you're operating beyond borders. Um, it's easy to ignore a national government and its, its incentives and its demands. So really, it's not an easy question to answer. It's an important question to raise. But I think ultimately, those pension funds are going to see their own self-interest in, um, in a more sustainable economy, and so on. Yeah. Okay, very good. We have uh, another round. Let's sort of go somewhere roughly in that direction. I see two hands there, and then a third hand to the right. You're, you're passing the hands I had in mind, but that's all right. Start over there. How receptive is the Chinese government to something like the Green New Deal? Okay, nice and short. Uh, just to rouse further, yes, uh, two ladies there. You mentioned that um, you went on the strong point that the real shortage is not in the, the amount of money, but in the amount of ideas, projects, and plans for that transformation to take place. Where do you expect them to come from? Is it, let's say, universities or uh, the private sector or the public sector, just more specifically? Yeah. Hi, uh, my question was more on uh, time scales. So obviously um, many of us are aware of the rather infamous deadline that the, the UN report gave about sort of, you know, 11 years, 10 years until uh, this reaches a, an irreversible point. Mm -hmm. What do you think the time scales are for the implementation of the Green New Deal should it get the kind of political backing that, that you're speaking about? Yeah. Okay, we'll have okay. A, another round later. Let's do those three now. <coughs> Quick, on the Chinese government. The Chinese government's already alert. The Chi I think the Chinese government has more to fear from social upheaval caused by climate breakdown. Uh, but certainly their central bank, for example, is already talking about greening finances and is in the forefront of the debates around central bank uh, changing their, their ways and their collateral frameworks. Projects, I mean, I think projects... Uh, need to be huge, uh, and getting us out of motor cars and into other more sustainable forms of transport is a project that only the state can undertake. Um, and of course, when it launches that and prepare, I mean, the HS2 is a project. It, it costs 82 billion or 85 billion, apparently. Clearly, the government sets out its plan to do that. It, it f promises to fund it, and that it invites the private sector to help make it happen. But it needs the state to have the big idea, to have the big plans, the big alternatives um, to, to lay out. So for me, that's where it will come. But of course, that doesn't mean to say the private sector can't think up projects as well, and that others and universities, for example, <coughs> couldn't play their role. And I hope very much that they will. But um, for me, the big projects will be defined by, by the state. Um, and then the question of the deadline and the 10 years, you know, if we were going to war tomorrow, uh, we would transform the system overnight, really. You know, if we were threatened by invasion or some such thing, or if the United States is threatened, in my view, the United States could turn on a dime, as they say, uh, if something were to happen to the dollar, if people were to lose confidence in the dollar, which is probably unlikely at the moment, but that could happen. So, um, you know, I, I, I think the timeline, the science is very clear, uh, the, pol the politicians haven't grasped the, the urgency of it. They're going to have to grab it. And I think it will take a catastrophic event. And those events are not unlikely. Um, we know already that a major city, Cape Town, has run out of water, has had the experience of running out of water. We know that Wall Street was nearly flooded by Hurricane Sandy. We know that California is on fire. It would just take a major city. We know, for example, there's an article in the London Review of Books this week about, about St. Albans uh, running out of water, and the water table running down. Now, St. Albans is a, a dormitory uh, sub, suburb for the city of London. You know, something like that just has to happen. The government will just have to get into gear and do things really urgently. And the question is, what will be the trigger that will make that happen? Very good. We have another round. Uh, let's come to this part. Um, and we work our way forward. The two hands there. One is Aurelia and then the lady next to him. And then we come further down. Hi. 
and uh, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say something about why there was such a kind of massive expansion in global credit. I can't bring, bring the exact figures to mind, but it's something like global credit doubles between 2000 and 2006, roughly like that. And I guess, why did that happen? And is that something that mm -hmm. needs to be addressed as part of this package? of mm -hmm. structural and policy transformation. Yeah. Oh, thanks again for your, for your presentation. Uh, uh, how do you reconcile the labor intensity message with a need for uh, stable salaries, or stable wages, particularly in the agricultural sector? If we go back to 25% of the population in the agricultural sector, wouldn't we go back to you know, subsistence level incomes in that sector at the same time? Mm. Okay, let's, let's do four, because there's a gentleman there, and then we come to the front row. Thanks. Um, also, about the labour intensive side, could you explain a bit more about what everyone's going to be doing in a labour intensive but no growth situation? Right. Okay, let's do a very quick fourth question and then. Okay. Since we're quite efficient. Yes, can you justify Europe, for example? Europe is about government, it's, they are, let's say, managing uh, the investment. Mm. Now, my question is we are living in a fourth revolution. This means I'm agree with your new deal coming locally. But government has not all the mean as the data, as the information should have, but it does not have. So it's lack of planning and strategy from government side. And that's what happens in Europe. That's why this type of non-growing, especially in southern part of Europe, because of not lacking of money, bad spending the money in program and projects. Yeah. And that's, that's what they create all this type of, uh, let's say, we can say revolution. For me, is a more, let's say, data-driven process from bottom, and I agree with you, where then you can plan, and then you can invest in the right direction. So the in financial sector should, pr should uh, let's say, integrate this risk before they send, the, I mean, private and public authorities. So the financial risk that coming because of not knowledge or data. Yeah. Okay, very good. So that's four for you. Okay. So why did credit expand? Well, credit expanded so wildly because it can. You know, credit, the creation of credit is almost effortless activity. And um, there are almost no restraints, constraints, on big institutions from creating credit. There is no government. They are literally, I mean, and this is where Polanyi is so right about the separation, you know, of the economic system from the, the state and from the political system. And, and that was the design. Um, Quint Slobodian's book, I do recommend his book, The Globalists, was, is a book that explains that the original Hayekian view was to create markets that were encased that were protected from any kind of democratic intervention. And we have today, we have markets encased, it's a lovely term, uh, away from and, you know, in, in, what's the word, you know, impenetrable in a sense by government. And in, in, that, in those circumstances, uh, credit creators are free to, to just go on churning out the stuff, you know. Um, so it, and the real problem though is ultimately credit must be linked to assets. Credit must be linked to finite and real assets. And what's wrong with those numbers is the complete dislocation of that amount of credit to the, the value of assets. And the financial crisis was caused not by banks running out of money. They never ran out of money. What they ran out of was trust in the valuation of assets. You say you've got subprime mortgages on your, your balance sheet. You say they're worth 300,000 or 300 million quid. I don't believe you. I don't think they are. Because, you know, subprime mortgages are falling in value. Or, or I just don't believe you. It's a matter of trust. That's what's so absolutely fundamental to the, to the monetary system. And when, when they no longer trusted the valuation of assets on banks' balance sheets, the system just collapsed, just like that. And, and so the problem with having so much credit relative to finite assets is that that moment is going to come. And the question is only when, really. But um, 
you know, up until 1973 in Britain, we had a system where the central bank guided the banks in the creation of credit and where that, should be, that credit should have been aimed. You weren't allowed to lend it so that someone could go and buy a lottery ticket. You were supposed to lend it for productive activity that would generate income and help to repay the loan, right? But in 1973, we lift those, the, that guidance and those regulations under the Competition Credit Control Act. And banks are now free to lend only on the basis of price, you know? And so we get the awful scene, uh, I don't know if you've all seen the big shorts, but there's that wonderful scene where the, the Wall Street bank is trying to find out whether or not the system is vulnerable, fragile, and he goes to Florida to look at the property market, and he goes to a nightclub, and there's a girl going around, a woman going around a pole, and he says to her, naked, and he says to her, do you have a mortgage? And she says, yeah, of course I got a mortgage. And he thinks, boy, she's, she lives off tips, but she's got a mortgage, you know. Um, and she, he says, is, and, and, and your, your interest rate, is it a variable rate? She says, yeah, of course it's a variable rate, you know, because I'm a very risky borrower. And he thinks, wow, this is it. The system is going to fall down. And he's about to walk out of the nightclub, and she says to him, by the way, I've got five mortgages. <laughs> and the reason she had five mortgages was that the bank could charge her 15% because she was such a risky borrower. So what happens in, after 73 is that credit is issued on the basis of price and not on whether or not that was the best way and the best direction for the credit. And so they went crazy. They would only lend, you know, lending to risky borrowers is, is the most profitable. So what to do about stable salaries um, in a labour-intensive um, in a labour-intensive economy, I really don't know. I think they have to be managed. You know, the government's going to have to play a part here, but we've had full employment in the past, and we've had stability and prosperity. We've managed it. Um, and, and I think we're going to have to manage it again. And whether or not we're going to have... Uh, why we should have very low salaries for... I think what's going to happen is that the kind of work we do is going to be valued in a different way. Right now, growing beans is not regarded as valuable work. Looking after people with dementia is not regarded as valuable. Uh, f speculating on finance and working in the City of London is regarded as very valuable work, right? I think this is all going to change as we begin to understand that actually our values have to change as well as our economic system. So I don't have a, I don't have a really sensible answer to that question, and I apologize for that. Um, your question on Europe, that, that they don't plan and they don't manage projects properly, is that what you're saying? They get the finance, but they don't... No, the government did program and strategy and the project from top down. Yeah. So who is this is Europe, not the local. And my, let's say, my question is, I agree with your approach, the green duty yeah. comes from down in a knowledge-based approach. Yes. And Yes. Yes. Our problem is that actually the economic system now is quite anarchic, and also the government and the state have been narrowed down and lack resources and lack skills and lack capacity. We're doing this to, right now to our own civil society. We're denuding our civil service, really. So we're getting rid of all skills and knowledge and background. We, we, we're deliberately saying you don't need that. You know, the market will solve the problem. And that's happening in Europe as much as it is here. But I think what's important, you're, I'm glad you raised the point about Europe, because the really important thing is that Europe provides a, a framework for countries to coordinate. So if they have a grand plan, you know, they can work that out together in a better way, in a better way than an individual isolated country in Ireland in the middle of, uh, of the Atlantic can do. So, so if, it's great pity that we're beginning to talk about leaving Europe at just that moment when actually we need to have a, a, a collection of, and a, a cooperation of states at that level in order to tackle these very big global challenges. Okay, very good. Um, there's a few hands going up. Let's do... Oh, God, <laughs> more hands. Let's do one very quick final round. And uh, I think the lady there in the middle was first to come up. Uh, with her hands, and then the gentleman just behind, and all the way over there. And apologies to everybody else. I'm over. You're waving very vigorously. Okay, that that convinces me. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, you talked about um, the lack of international political leadership to save the world um, yeah. because there isn't a movement below it. Um, so I just wonder if you could maybe talk about what we can do to create that movement to generate that leadership. Okay. Um, gentleman, slide behind. I'm going to chase you around with your microphone. Apologies for that. It's good for your health. Thank you. I want to ask her, what do you think the accounting practices in the accounting industry needs to change in order to adapt to this new deal? Because at the moment, the corporate practices needs uh, you know, uh, to look at the uh, performance of companies every quarter or something like that. And does your Green New Deal necessitates a creation of a, you know, like a national government version of a big four? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and then the lady right in the front here. I told you I'll have you walk around a lot. Thank you. Um, hi. It's a follow-up question on Europe. There has been uh, this notion of creating the European Green New Deal. Do you think it's a feasible uh, project to have something like that in Europe, considering the fact that the currency is not... Well, each country doesn't have its own sovereign currency, and well, Europe works and operates as a trade bloc? Do you think it's a feasible and possible uh, notion? Yeah. Let's do a very quick fourth and final question because the microphone is just next to you. No, it's just gentlemen there waving keenly. <clears throat> Thanks very much. I would like to ask you, did a really uh, nice example of the Dust Bowl um, and as we come uh, closer with Roosevelt, that example that you explained, as we come closer to this next economic crash, Obviously, there's the ecological crisis, which yeah. might be a, a, a amalgamation of both of them. So I really like the idea of potential projects in, for transformation. Uh, that was a great example of a project that Roosevelt created, and I would just love to know more about like how, uh, how we could move towards restoration projects. Right, sure. Um, four final questions to round it off. So, um, the movement from below, how do we create leaders? Well, I think we do what we're doing. I mean, I think Extinction Rebellion and all of the uprisings, the insurgencies that we're seeing will create those leaders. Um, I mean, it's really hard to think about. Um, I'm, I'm very dependent on Polanyi's analysis, and Polanyi was, was very clear that, you know, we have the, the economic system, which is independent of the political system, and uh, any attempt to, uh, of the political system to interfere with the economic system, so the, this, this state of separation of the two is ultimately catastrophic. He, calls it, he says it's utopian to believe you can run a market economy independently of, of politics and of the state. So he feels that, that, that there will always be a crisis, there's going to be a crisis. But what also makes the crisis worse is when the political process tries to interfere in the market and disrupts the market as well. So the two things, so, you know, he's pretty dismal about it. And he says out of that rose fascism in the 1930s. And I think we're seeing across the world insurgencies, not just in one country, but around the world, from the Philippines to Brazil to Russia to the United States to Britain, wherever you look, there's these political insurgencies which can just move towards authoritarianism and which seem to want to do that, seem to be moving in that direction. There's very little moving it in a more progressive direction. And the question is, can that be done? Um, I think we will get the leaders um, out of, out of a, progressive, a progressive leader out of progressive movements. And I think the work we're doing on, on drawing attention to the science, Greta Thunberg has just been amazing, as, as has Extreme Rebellion. And, and have, you know, but the thing is, we've been doing this for 20, 30 years. We've certainly been doing it for 11 years. And it's been so hard. But out of that, I think, we just have to keep beavering away as a movement. Um, I think I just married two big subjects there, which are, I, these are two big questions to deal with here. On the accounting industry, I'm really no expert on that. I don't see it as becoming 
a sort of government funded or government uh, institutionalized system. What I do think is we definitely need more diversity, that there's a lot of corruption between accountants and these big corporations, a lot of collusion, and the fact that it's so concentrated as an industry is deeply destabilizing and, 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 and difficult. My colleague, uh, Richard Murphy, on the Green New Deal is much more of an expert on the, on the industry. So I recommend that you look at some of his work because he, he understands this, the, the industry much better than I do. The European GND, absolutely it's feasible. Of course it's feasible. And, you know, if, if countries would only coordinate and cooperate. And again, for that we need leadership, but also for that we need a movement from below. And we're already beginning to see that happen. Um, uh, Yanis Varoufakis is, is promoting it, but I'm finding myself being invited uh, to European countries. Um, I'm going to three countries in one week soon uh, because there's so much interest across Europe in the Green New Deal. And, and yes, I mean, this would be a thing that could unite Europe in a really positive way. This could be a project that could bring all the peoples of Europe together behind a single, uh, you know, d transformational demand and, and do great things for it. Unfortunately, the European monetary system is designed for that not to happen. But that's a whole big story, and I'm not going to go down that road now. Um, on the question of the Dust Bowl and how that worked, um, I mean, it was very simple. He simply hired unemployed men um, and uh, put them in conservation corps, gave them spades and probably trees, and, um, and sent them out to plant trees. Now, I, I, mean, the way, I mean, there was already a conservation movement in the United States at that point, so they built on that. But really, it started on a very simple basis of you, you know, unskilled workers being mobilized into camps, being paid and fed and supported. Um, unfortunately, he segregated them between black and white, and he, he wouldn't allow women to do this, and women are particularly good at that. Um, but it was the kind of work that was absolutely essential to restore the health of the of the agricultural sector, um, but not very difficult to do. It was planting trees, it was setting up parks, and so on. There's a, there's a, a book called Nature's New Deal, which I recommend you read, which goes into it in much more detail. Right. Okay, very good. So this is the end of uh, tonight's uh, uh, event. Um, almost the end, because one more thing will happen that Anne is available outside. If you're interested in her book, She's outside to sign books, so there's a chance to continue the conversation outside. But in the meantime, let's, uh, let's thank Anne very much for a really fascinating <laughs>